Hi, this is Dr. Neil Shaw, and you're listening to Masters of Beauty. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Park. Dr. Stephen Park is a world-famous otolaryngologist who does things a little bit differently. Rather than using conventional medications and therapies, he's discovered ways for patients to improve their symptoms naturally and avoiding medications. We're going to dive deep in this episode and find out why so many of us have deviated septums and ways that we can sleep better, both with and without surgery. So uh, I'm uh, pleased to be joined by Dr. Stephen Park, and he is board certified in both otolaryngology, uh, which stands for ear, nose, and throat. Uh, and these are the doctors of uh, the head and neck area, the masters of the head and neck, and in sleep medicine. Uh, he received his BA from the Johns Hopkins University and his medical degree from Columbia University. His ENT residency was completed at Montefiore Medical Center in New York, as well as Albert Einstein. And he's been in practice uh, and a thriving private practice for like the last 13 years or so. Uh, he also is at the faculty of Montefiore in the Bronx and is an assistant professor of otorhinolaryngology. Most of us forget about the rhino part, which is just as important <laughs> as the other, other parts of otolaryngology. Um, he's also the author of an awesome bestseller, which is called Sleep Interrupted. Uh, a, a physician reveals the number one reason why so many of us are sick and tired. Uh, and if you haven't listened to his podcast, his podcast is awesome. It's the Breathe Right Better, uh, sorry, the Breathe Better, Sleep Better, Live Better podcast, um, which I think is amazing because it talks about a lot of things that um, a lot of doctors either don't know, don't want to talk about, and it's really informative for everyone, and I'm a big fan of it. Um, his main mission is to empower anyone with chronic health ailments uh, as a result of poor sleep and help us all find resources to help us rejuvenate, restore, and regain optimal health and wellness again. So welcome, Dr. Park. It's awesome having you here. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me. Cool. Um, so um, the first question we're going to start off with is your background and how you became interested in facial beauty and how that relates to optimal breathing and sleep. Yeah, so... You know, when I, I remember taking uh, plastic surgery classes during residency, and I distinctly remember discussing the optimal facial features that's that's um, defined for what defines facial beauty. And I remember you remember all the landmarks they give for women and men, and I, I do remember say, um, hearing that the, the the jaws are a very prominent feature what determines what the beautiful face looks like. And but if you look at modern humans these days, it's really striking that um, the, our perception of facial beauty has changed dramatically. So for example, uh, if, you look, if you look at those uh, movie stars in the 1940s and 50s, the black and white movies, all the male and female movie stars had these wide square jaws, right? Prominent cheekbones, nice teeth. That was what was considered attractive. But now, if, if you look at all the younger uh, movie stars and celebrities, they have these triangular faces with recessed jaws. It's, it's, it's pretty striking. Um, and, and there was a study, I forget where it was done, but um, there's a study looking at people's perceptions of facial beauty. And now because everyone's faces are smaller, these same people are preferring people with smaller, more narrow faces. So you think there's a selection element going on in as Probably. far as reproductive? Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting. And I think that, um, yeah, we definitely get a variety in, in our practice alone of talking about patients who want, sometimes want that V-shaped look, which is definitely mm -hmm. popular, uh, especially in Asia. They kind of coined that term V-line v surgery for yes. uh, creating that narrower look um, and, and going from there. Uh, so as we relate to facial beauty, um, do you notice any difference with crooked teeth and facial beauty and how that, those two terms kind of relate? Sure. So when I started out as a general ENT doctor, I treated all kinds of, or all ranges of ENT problems, ear problems, sinus infections, throat problems, snoring. And what I realized was that people who had more crooked teeth and smaller mouths had more illnesses, more range of problems. And many of these people also snored. And so when I started to look for sleep apnea in these patients, 
I got much better outcomes treating the general ENT problems. So ear problems, sinus problems, or problems got much better when you look for and treat the snoring and sleep apnea. Uh, and so it kind of makes sense. If you have crooked teeth, that means your jaws are too small to hold all your teeth. This is one of the reasons why the, dent the dentists are saying that over, about 100 years ago, most people still had their third wisdom teeth coming in. Now it's a given that either it's going to get impacted or you have to take them out. It just means that the jaws are just too small to hold all your teeth. That also narrows your airway by definition. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. And uh, do you think the, not just a re result of us kind of having smaller jaws in general, do you think the mouth breathing is contributing to the crooked teeth at all as well, or not necessarily? Well, there, that's a big controversy, what causes what? But we know that there are monkey studies, there are little crew experiments where they plug monkeys' noses when they're first born, and they had obvious jaw underdevelopment. Um, and so it's a, pretty much a given that if you plug someone's nose, um, they have mouth breathing, the, long, the face gets longer. It's called adenoid facies, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, so we see this all the time, kids with large adenoids. They, they're, they mouth breathe, the face gets longer and more recessed. Um, and so nasal congestion is, is a major risk factor, but there are a lot of other um, common risk factors out there that, that causes malocclusion, especially as evidenced in the dental literature. Um, so do you have any idea why our human faces are shrinking, like why are, um, and why our airways are shrinking as well and why that's happening? Okay. Well, you first have to kind of look at why humans are susceptible to these sleep breathing problems. Uh, there was a major landmark paper by this guy named Terrence Davidson from UC San Diego many years ago. He looked at the evolutionary causes of snoring and sleep apnea. And what he kind of um, revealed was that, and it kind of makes sense that because we can talk and speak and have complex speech and language, we're susceptible to sleep breathing problems. Uh, fundamentally, our voice boxes are I have descended. So for example, in chimpanzees and human infants, the voice box is high up behind the tongue, but then during development, it descends. And so initially the epiglottis and the soft palate overlap like this. So that's why infants can breathe and suck at the same time, but around four to six months, it starts to separate away and the, the voice box descends underneath the tongue and the tongue kind of takes up that space. So only humans have a true oropharynx, which is that space between the palate and, and the voice box. And so because of this descent, the tissues, the soft tissues have to be more pliable and floppy to be able to talk and articulate complex speech and language, right? Um, and so that's why only humans have all these choking and swallowing problems that animals generally don't have. Now we did okay for you know, thousands of years and then we messed everything up by changing our diets. So number one, modern Western diets are softer um, they're obviously they're less nutritious, more processed sugars, uh, refined sugars. Um, actually, there's a, another book that, that really influenced my way of thinking is a, a book, you may be familiar with this, Dr. Weston Price, he's a dentist that traveled the world in the 1930s and 40s, looked at these indigenous cultures that ate completely off the land and they had perfect straight teeth with no cavities and they were healthy. Oh, no, I'm not familiar with that book. Oh. Yeah, it's called Nutrition and Physical De Degeneration. Um, there's actually a, a really uh, loyal group of people on an organization called the Western Price Foundation. They're into natural uh, eating, uh, very, very prominent um, in, in the nutrition field. So it's kind but, of a pre-paleo. Uh, yeah, before, exactly. before people were into paleo, they were into this. That's kind of cool. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it still is. But what they, what he found was that as he went back every 10, 15 years, when they started to adopt Western diets, their children's teeth can be much more crooked, crowded, more cavities, more sickly, more prone to infectious diseases. So in one generation, that happened. So the other risk factors are, so not only soft diet, so there's um, an anthropologic, anthropology, sorry, uh, medical anthropo anthropologist, um, Dr. Corcini found that communities in North America that eat soft foods have more dental crowding and malocclusion. So soft diets, bottle feeding, uh, thumb sucking, pacify use, nasal congestion, uh, also, um, na uh, prematurity is a risk factor for sleep apnea. So, and also many toxins that prevent your jaws from growing properly. So there's a lot of different factors in modern life that contribute besides your genes too, which is a big factor. Oh, that's fascinating. Actually, I did not put the soft diet and the, um, you know, kind of the malocclusion kind of uh, piece of the puzzle together. Um, also talking about this uh, facial fullness and straight teeth leading to wrinkles to kind of tie this into our beauty uh, side of things. So yep. um, how are those kind of correlated? Okay. Well, let me give you a little funny story. So I have quite often, maybe once a month, I have middle-aged women coming in with, let's say, 
frequent sinus infections, headaches, misery. Uh, they get put on multiple antibiotics and it doesn't work. And maybe they've suffered for about six weeks. They come to see me and I ask them, do you sleep on your backside or stomach? They say, I sleep on my back. I don't believe her because the mouth is so tiny. People with small mouths generally don't sleep on their backs. Actually, most modern humans can't sleep on their backs anymore, but they prefer not to. So then I ask her, well, when you're a teenager, how'd you sleep on my stomach? Well, when did you change? Uh, six, about six or seven weeks ago. Why? My dermatologist told me don't sleep on your stomach because it causes facial wrinkles. So <laughs> what's happening is that now she's sleeping on her back, her tongue falls back more when she's in deep sleep and she's waking up. So you're going to get more wrinkles if you don't sleep. But going back to the facial structure, the fuller your face, the more it tightens your muscles of your, of your throat on the inside so you can breathe better, but also tightens your facial skin. So it, as you age, the skin doesn't relax as much because the jaws are more full. That makes sense. Um, now, kind of talking about sleep position and all that, mm -hmm. um, that that's always like that, that controversial thing. Is there a best position to sleep? Um, some people talk about having their head raised a little bit, you know, putting blocks mm -hmm. under the bed, which may or may not work. Your thoughts on sleep position, is it the side? Is, the, is it the back with blocks, if you can do that? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it kind of sleeping on her stomach? Uh, mm -hmm. What would be the, what, the one position, or is there one? There is no one position. I tell patients, whatever you're most comfortable sleeping in when you're younger. Now, problems happen when you artificially change that position. So like, for example, the dermatology example, but more often than not, it's due to surgery. So let's say you're a stomach or side sleeper, and now you had surgery, like a knee surgery, hip surgery, or abdominal surgery, and now you have to sleep on your back, or even breast surgery. And because you can't breathe on your back, you wake up more often, you have less quality of sleep. Uh, so anything that prevents you from sleeping in your normal position is going to um, worsen your sleep quality. Now, inclining your head is gonna help a little bit because you're taking away the effect of gravity right? But it helps only to some degree. Another thing to think about is the position, position of your neck. So a lot of people who snore use these contour pillows to extend the neck a little bit. So that opens up the airway a little bit, like what the anesthesiologists do to open up the airway. So that helps some people sometimes. Um, but if you hit, keep your head down like this, that's going to narrow the airway more. Uh, also, if you open your mouth, the tongue goes back. So people who have nasal congestion snore more and stop breathing more often. Uh, I, I mistakenly, I've, I've tried to like hack my own sleep. And mm -hmm. um, so one way is I tried to lift my bed up and I figured, hey, guess what? If I do it at like, you know, they say 10 to 15 degrees is better mm -hmm. than flat. Um, yeah. And so if I do it at maybe 30 degrees, that'll be even better. Well, first of all, my mm -hmm. wife is furious at me. Like, what are you doing? What did you do to our bed? <laughs> uh, the, the second issue was I, I, I put a little um, tracker on. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with something called better. It like tracks your apneas at night and oxygen levels. And I was having apneic events and I was all freaked out. Um, and I think it was self-induced because I was putting my head down like you talked about. Um, and oftentimes it's just probably a, a little gentle incline is better than massive incline. Um, and yeah. the head position is probably a little bit better. Exactly. Yeah, so actually that incline principle is recommended quite often for people with acid reflux. And that's one of the other um, connections that I made. People who have sleep apnea also have acid reflux by definition, because every time you stop breathing, you physically forcefully suction up your normal stomach juice into your throat. And so grab the incline your head up a little bit does help to some degree, but if you have apneas, it's gonna overwhelm the effect of gravity. It just brings everything up to your throat. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of separate like sleep disturbance and sleep apnea and kind of get these all confused. So for someone who's coming and saying, hey, guess what? I don't know, maybe I can black out my windows. Maybe I can put noise sound proof things, whatever, and optimize my temperature. Um, uh, can you kind of like explain for us what, why there's different types of sleep problems and when they should see uh, a sleep specialist um, and what kind sure. of algorithm? Sure, that's a great question because um, I mean, the first thing you should do before you see, a, you see a doctor is to work on sleep hygiene techniques. So these are these top 10 lists of things to do uh, before you see a doctor. So close out all your windows so they're completely dark. Don't read electronic screens before bedtime because the blue lights lower melatonin. Um, use the bed for sleep and sex only. There's, again, there's a long list of things in the sleep hygiene realm. Um, that's more in the insomnia realm. Now, the problem is that with modern life, there's so many distractions like screens, 
uh, dog barking, noises, <laughs> uh, internet, social media. Uh, and then on top of that, more and more people have these breathing problems as a result of our narrow jaws. So it's hard to separate out what's causing what. But clearly, you should start with the conservative options first. And then if that doesn't work, you go to the to, to a medical doctor, especially if you snore, because if you snore, you have a high chance of having sleep apnea. Um, and that, that's a serious medical condition that goes undiagnosed in most people. And so if, if you kind of look at sleep apnea patients, so someone comes in and says, you know what, I snore, um, you know, I, I, I just know I snore. My partner tells me I snore. I've done an app and I snore. They come and see you. What percentage, like if someone says, um, where is my problem with apnea? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it going to be, what percentage do you think is nose, tongue, jawline, or kind of, if you, it's obviously different from person to person. Yeah, it, it's all over the place. I mean, I have many young, thin people who snore heavily with severe sleep apnea. I have young, thin women who don't snore at all who have severe sleep apnea. Um, I have people who stop breathing 30 times an hour who don't have any apneas. <laughs> so it's, it's not just being overweight that causes apneas or, or causes you to snore to have sleep apnea. It's, it's a physical jaw structure problem. So most of my patients that I see don't really have severe apnea. Um, what, they ha what happens is they stop breathing a lot, but the threshold isn't long enough to be called apnea, so they keep waking up. So these people have very tiny mouths, high arch palates, dental crowding. They've had multiple dental work in the past. The tongue set's really high. The tonsils are usually small. Um, so it's, just, it's a jaw structure problem more than a soft tissue problem, but most people have both. And, and so how do you solve that? They come and see you and say, I want to, um, I want to solve this issue. Um, because um, maybe I don't need, let's say we talked about, you kind of alluded to that, they, maybe they don't need a uke triple P or tonsil surgery. Maybe they don't need a tongue-based reduction surgery and maybe they don't need a nose surgery. So it's a smaller jaw, which some of the solutions we can look for. All right. So the number one tip that I give to all my patients, and this takes care of literally maybe 10 to 15% of patient symptoms, is don't eat late before bedtime. Oh, wow. And that's yeah. going to be obviously the reflux. Yes, but what happens is, if you, again, if you stop breathing just once in a while, the more reflux you have, the more inflammation you have, especially if you have, let's say, small tonsils, it's going to get bigger, causing more obstruction. So the, 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 actually, on top of that, in addition to not eating late, um, the other th important thing is improving nasal breathing, because the more stuff your nose is, the more of a vacuum effect you create in that stream, and causing more obstructions, causing more reflux. They've actually shown that reflux, from, when, you stop, when you stop breathing, can go into your nose, sinuses, ears, and your lungs, causing massive inflammation. So those two things, if you start with that, that takes care of about a quarter of all my ENT sinus, ENT um, patient symptoms in general. And what are your thoughts? I know that you, you don't love medicine. I'll, I'll mention things, and I'm not sure I'm a big fan of medicine myself. Uh, so someone comes in and says, well, should I take Prilosec? Are you pro-Prilosec, anti-Prilosec? Um, and what are your thoughts? Yeah. So my feeling is that acid reflux medicines do absolutely nothing for reflux. What it does instead is it lowers acid secretion, but the stomach juices still come up, just less acidic. But what you also find is pepsin, which is the enzyme that degrades pep proteins in sinus and ear and lung fluid, and it irritates the throat. And so, yes, it can help you know, for short-term periods, um, but it doesn't really treat true reflux. A uh, better way is to, again, that's why you have to empty your stomach before you go to bed. Don't eat close to bedtime. Um, but in the old days, we used to have these medications, what we call these pro-motility medications, like proposed that empty the stomach faster you know, for diabetics, but that got taken off the market. Um, so it, it, it's really hard to um, treat this completely because it's fundamentally an anatomic problem along with the dietary habits and lifestyle habits. Okay, so um, so kind of a, a take-home point for our listeners is don't eat too close to bed. Um, we use our time span three hours, and then are you a fan of a little bit of uh, bed elevation for that purpose, or you think it's it's dependent well, on the patient? I think that depends more if you have to sit on your back. For, let's say you have a shoulder injury or something. Um, if most people will tell you, I can only sleep on my side or stomach. That's it. So that's your position. Um, but in inclining your bed, there's nothing wrong with experimenting. And some people do find that's helpful, especially for reflux of this. But again, reflux and apnea all go together. You're taking away the effect of gravity. Okay. We're going to dive into the nose now because that's another okay. part, I think a big part of that. And I think sure. especially with breathing. Okay. So someone comes in, they have a stuffy nose. Your thoughts on nasal steroids or antihistamine spray or histamine pills 
Um, first of all, it's the first line, of, whether they have allergies or not. And right. So before we talk about medications, um, if they have allergies, then you have to control the environment. So a lot of people have pets at home, uh, dust issues, um, various, and also environmental allergies and seasonal allergies. So you have to control that uh, from a conservative standpoint, you have a filter, um, showering before you go to bed, that kind of stuff. Um, but let's say that you've tried all that and that you're still stuffy, you have allergy symptoms. At that point, I, 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 tr I try not to give medications, but honestly, every medication, almost 90% of all the medications that we give in our field, I'm sure your field too, has detrimental effects on sleep, directly or indirectly. So for example, the um, high blood pressure medications, because it relaxes your blood vessels, it also relaxes your blood vessels in your nose, causing more congestion. That's a major side effect of high blood pressure medications. By also re lowering your sympathetic tone, it also lowers the pathway of melatonin production in your brain. The melatonin is, the, the pathway goes from the eyes to the, to the, um, um, the thalamus down to the superior cervical ganglion in your brainstem, goes back up to the pineal gland. So if you lower sympathetic tone, you're lowering melatonin. Um, and I could, I could list all the side effects from all the other medications as well. So for those men who take Viagra, um, if they take yeah, it right yeah, before yeah. they go to bed, they're going to have a problem. They may have uh, uh, some fun that night, but they're probably going to have difficulty sleeping. They're going to have a stuffy nose. Well, well, you know what? I have a good answer to that. If you look at the urology literature, if you do sleep studies on every man with erectile dysfunction, about 60 to 70% will have undiagnosed sleep apnea. And when you treat it, half those people are cured instantly. And another quarter get much better. Oh, that's interesting. So treated meaning which way? Treating meaning with? Um, with CPAP. With CPAP, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I thought you were talking about the erectile dysfunction being treated. So I was like, okay. Oh, uh, no. Okay, that's nothing. Okay. So they don't, they don't have erectile dysfunction anymore because they're on CPAP. That's a great way of, uh, so you're, you're actually treating it more of kind of the cause of that. Great point, great point. You mentioned one thing too that I, I didn't want to gloss over. You mentioned showering mm -hmm. before you go to bed with allergies. Uh, did, yes. did you say that? Uh, how come? Uh, because if you work, for example, if you work outdoors, you have pollens in your hair, and then you're rubbing your hair into the pillows, and you toss it, around, and you're breathing in pollens. Great, 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 great tip. Awesome point. Okay, so um, so we talk about that, um, and then so for the allergies, they've done all that. Um, mm -hmm. They're still stuffy. They say, "Hey, guess what? I wake up and I am miserable. My nose is completely mm -hmm. stuffy. Um, I don't want to use. Uh, what are some things they can do? Um, you know, because we're not we're not taking antihistamines because it's issues uh, potentially with that. Maybe sure. uh, sprays. Are you okay with sprays or? Well, I think starting with nasal saline is the best way to go. Uh, the problem with that is it's a little inconvenient because you have to do it often for it to work. Um, and you can use different ways of getting into your nose. There's a neti pot, there's spray bottles and squeeze bottles and aerosol cans. But any kind of salt water is good to decongest the nose. It's a mild decongestant, but you have to do it on a regular basis. Um, so that's the first way of handling these nasal sinus issues. But if you want to try medical therapy, I, I prefer the nasal steroids because it doesn't get absorbed into your bloodstream. Uh, and it works more as a prophylactic medication. And then, so I'll, I'll give, I'll start people on the antihistamine just for short periods and then take them off and maintain the steroids. But ultimately that's not the most ideal uh, way to go either because it's a, it's a steroid. But the problem is that giving a, a patient a steroid medication is not gonna change your deviated septum. Because most people with smaller jaws have deviated septums. And the reason is that if your heart palate doesn't drop during development, as the septum, the middle of your nose, as the septum grows, if the floor of your nose doesn't drop, it's going to buckle to one side. Oh, great point. So these people also have nasal, more narrow nasal cavities, heart palate, crooked septum, more irrit irritable noses, and swelling of the turbinates. And lastly, the one thing that a lot of doctors don't think about is when the nostrils cave in, because the angle of the nostril compared to the septum, instead of being like this, is more like this, and you're more stuffy on the inside, so the nostrils cave in easier. So that's, those are the three things that I always look for. So clearly, um, you know, African-Americans have broader noses and the cartilage is stiffer, but Caucasians have, tend to have more narrow noses. They're more susceptible to nostril collapse. So these are the people that benefit from breed right strips and these gadgets to keep your nostrils open. But you have to treat inflammation, you have to treat the structural problems and the nostril collapse medically, and then as a last resort, surgery.
Um, so for that surgery part, um, mm -hmm. are, are you okay with patients? If, if Do you like using breathe right strips as sort of like a diagnosis of valve issues and say, hey, guess what? I breathe better with a breathe right strip. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump into a surgical solution then. Are you okay with that as sort of a, a test uh, bit? Sure. Sure. Well, there's a maneuver, I mean, you may be familiar with this, called a caudal maneuver, where you lift the nostrils up. I also use Q-tips to kind of lift up the nostrils from the inside, um, but they get this wow sensation when you do that. And then in the meantime, until surgery, they can use breathe right strips along with the nasal steroid sprays. Um, but um, I, I, I get, the most common surgery I do is nasal surgery to help them breathe through the nose. Now, one caveat about nasal surgery is that it's been documented that in general, it doesn't help your sleep apnea which is a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but the evidence is out there. It doesn't really treat sleep apnea. However, patients feel better subjectively, which, which makes sense. Um, and when you're doing nasal surgery for, um, I guess, generalized breathing, um, do you dive into all the components? Do you like septoplasty, turbinates, valve? And then yeah. um, what are some of your solutions for valve uh, repair if you dive into that? So the septoplasty, that's a pretty standard technique. Uh, turbinates, a little bit of controversy about what the better technique is, but everyone has their favorite technique. Uh, but the valve, that's a little bit tricky because it's external. It, it kind of goes into the cosmetic realm too sometimes. Um, and so, I mean, the, the standard way is the Ehler band graft. I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's usually an open rhinoplasty, but you can do it closed also. So I, I still do that once in a while. You know, you can take colors from the septum or the ear. Um, another technique that I do, now I don't do rhinoplasty for cosmetic reasons, I don't do plastic cosmetic surgery, but I do nasal functional surgery. But it's there's a big overlap between the two. Absolutely. Um, and what I do, I'm also looking out for cosmetic issues, but not you know, formally as a cosmetic surgeon. Um, so I, I kind of take into consideration how the nose is going to look. So you know when you do these airless band grafts, it does make the nose a little bit fuller to, to some degree. Um, and then there's another technique. I do sometimes with the suspension technique where I put a little, make an incision here under the eyelid, pop a tiny screw into the bone and thread a suture under the skin, grab the nostril and lift up and suspend the nostril. Um, so that, that's, I do that once or twice a year for second, third line options. Um, more recently, what I've been doing is um, I modified a technique that was put out by uh, Medtronic. Are you familiar with the ALR technique? ALR stent. Uh, um, one of my, yeah, one of my colleagues at, at my medical school, he worked with Medtronic to develop the stent to help to overlap the the two parts of the um the nostril, the upper and lower lateral cartilage. So what they do is actually you can look this up when you, when we're done. There's a video if you look up ALR A L A R Medtronic stent. You see an animation of how it's done. I, I've seen it. I haven't used it personally. So yeah. I, I've seen yeah. it. So, it stays so in there temporarily. It. Is that right? You yeah. take it out in a week and it scars in a different position. Is that the, the exactly. concept behind yeah. it? You make, you make a cut inside the nose between the two cartilages. And you peel the skin off the cartilage on the upper cartilage and you overlap about two or three millimeters and you and let it heal. So it stiffens the nostril. But the stent helps you to do it much more effectively. Now I started doing this, I got good results, but then the hospital wouldn't stop the stent for me anymore. So I started doing it without the stent, I got just as good results. It's a very simple conservative operation. Obviously there's certain people that are more good candidates. For example, if you have very uh, flaring nostrils, you don't want to lift the nostrils up too much. So some people are not, they're not good candidates for that. So that, that's my go-to operation for most people, but not everyone. And it doesn't, again, it, because it's so conservative, it doesn't work 100%, maybe 60, 70%. But when you do it along with the, the septum and the turbinate, you can, overall, you get pretty good results. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And usually different, there's lots of different techniques with the nose. And mm -hmm. if you find that constellation of techniques that kind of all kind of go together for each person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, so some of the things that we're talking about is you mentioned that some of the patients having sleep issues, uh, mm -hmm. stop breathing 25 times an hour, and not really having sleep apnea on a sleep test. Um, so, uh, so these are the people that are kind of like not having enough for an apnea um, uh, and, and kind of treating those aspects of it. So it's really, those are the patients who are kind of the subclinical um, yes. where you think those are the patients with reflux and um, other things and then occasionally with surgery, correct? Sure. So this is called upper airway resistance syndrome or UARS. 
And this is described by a Stanford uh, sleep doctor, Dr. Christian Gimeno. He actually just recently passed away. He, he, he's a luminary in sleep medicine. He coined the term sleep apnea. Um, and so he's a big figure in sleep medicine. But um, what he noticed was that, this is 1993, I think, he published a paper showing that in young, thin men and women who were severely tired and fatigued, but didn't have sleep apnea officially on the sleep test, what he did was he put an esophageal pressure catheter into the chest cavity and did a sleep study and found that with each successive breath, the pressure would get more and more negative. So they're breathing against a closed throat. And after a couple of breaths, you get more and more negative and they would wake up from deeper light sleep. So they would have frequent arousals from sleep, but not waking up completely. So it's fragmented sleep. And so essentially another way of looking at this or to, another way of describing it is that it's how you describe apnea on a sleep study. Apnea means 10 second pauses for men. For, so for, uh, for adults it's 10 seconds, for children it's two normal miss, missed breaths. So let's say, so, so the diagnosis of sleep apnea you get if you have five or more apneas per hour. But let's say that you stop breathing 30 times an hour for nine seconds each or two seconds each, then you don't have apnea on a sleep study. So you don't have lack of oxygen, you don't, the oxygen doesn't drop, but you have sleep fragmentation. And that leads to chronic fatigue issues, um, anxiety, depression, headaches, digestive issues, all these conditions that doctors have no idea what to do with because you look healthy, but your symptoms are just out of proportion to what you're seeing on the sleep test. And these people by definition all have very small mouths. So when they obstruct, they wake up too quickly as opposed to sleep apnea patients when they obstruct, they don't wake up quickly enough. Well, do you do you find uh, dental uh, guards or things that kind of help with the jaw um, useful? Yeah, so if used for in proper ways, now the, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's two standard recommendations for mild snoring and mild just moderate sleep apnea is either CPAP or the a mandibular advancement guard. These are these custom made guards that move the lower jaw forward, and there are these over the counter options that are very low tech. Uh, bulky options, and they work. They don't work that well, but sometimes they work. But anything that moves the jaw forward will pull the tongue forward and tighten the soft palate. And so there are dentists that do this. That they, they're very good at doing this. Um, but not everyone's a very good candidate because, first of all, if your nose is stuffy, you won't be able to tolerate CPAP or the mouth guard. So they've shown in studies that if you op optimize nasal breathing, you can tolerate dental appliances and CPAP much better. So that's why I'm so adamant about optimizing your breathing to get them prepared for these other options, these non-surgical options that, that come later. Um, so these over-the-counter options that you see a lot, they can help, they can be helpful sometimes in some people. So I'm not saying it's, it's worthless, but it's, it's, you're not going to get the same degree of effectiveness as you went to a formal device. Now, you mentioned earlier in the podcast about dermatologists having people not uh, lay on their face for wrinkles. Mm -hmm. Are there mm -hmm. any other uh, ways that doctors can worsen your airway? Yeah, so th this is a huge revelation for me. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing this myself. For example, um, early in my career, a standard way of doing septoplasty, and you probably know, is to use nasal packs or splints, right? And so, and then patients would complain, they'd be miserable having those packs in. And when I went to the literature, I saw that by putting nasal packs in your nose, you create apneas. So they took, they took healthy college students, put in packs for three days, the sleep studies, their apneas went up. So that's, that's a good reason why they're miserable. So me, early in my career, I stopped using packs or sprints completely. So that's one way you can aggravate sleep breathing problems by using nasal packing, right? But then, for example, um, I mentioned this before, if you do any kind of surgery that prevents you from sleeping on your side or stomach, that's going to make sleep worse. Um, now, dentists also, sometimes what they do is, in the process of doing standard orthodontics, they take out four bicuspids. Now, some people, in addition to the four bicuspids, they have to take the four wisdom the molars out, the four wisdom teeth. So now they have, they have a small mouth to begin with, you take out eight teeth total, those people are in trouble. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or in another, in another dental realm, um, let's say you have a, a mismatch of your bite. So let's say your lower jaw is more protuberant than the upper jaw. And so the ideal way is to pull your upper jaw forward 
but and use it, but more the more standard way is to push your lower jaw back. So anything that retracts your jaws back is going to narrow your airway more. Cool. Yeah. Um, what else? Oh, this is another thing that I'm sure you see sometimes. You now, when you do a standard rhinoplasty, let's say you want to narrow the tip. Um, and we saw this quite often, like in the 1950s, Dr. Goldman in New York City. Very aggressive he, he rhinoplasty. Really, yeah, 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 we know his name. Very really, aggressive. Really, yeah, really pointy, upturned noses. But in the process, when you narrow the tip, you have to shave off some of the uh, the upper, the low lateral cartilage. And that narrows the tip, but in the process, you're also weakening the valve. That's why you have to think about these things when you're doing any kind of nasal surgery is to prevent that that collapse that's going to happen later on. So I think that's a concept that most plastic surgeons are aware of these days. But uh, we still see patients from 20, 30 years ago that have these pointy, pointy noses that have nasal congestion. Uh, yeah, I was in New York for a little bit, and they're all over the place. And a lot of these uh, ladies who are... Uh in their 70s and 80s have these really, really small noses that I'm not sure yes. they're they're breathing from their nose at all. No. <laughs> um, well, amazing stuff. I think, um, is there a takeaway point that we can kind of uh, let everyone know about kind of sleep that you can share us with? Sure. Well, I think you'll agree with me that good quality sleep is essential for health and beauty. I totally agree. Um, because if you don't sleep, your body doesn't heal well, you don't feel well, uh, not sleeping well, also increases your hunger for unhealthy, sugary, fatty foods. It's also hard to lose weight if you don't sleep well. So it's this vicious cycle of poor breathing leads to poor sleep, leads to poor eating, causing weight gain. Um, it's just this, this conglomeration of symptoms that, is, it's, that stems from poor breathing. So not just during the nighttime, but also daytime too, because if you notice that during the daytime, you breathe through your mouth. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is very important. It, with the reason why it's so important to breathe through your nose is that the nose makes a gas, makes a gas called nitric oxide, which is a is a, a gas that dilates blood vessels. And so, if you bypass your nose and breathe through your mouth, you're missing out on nitric oxide going into your lungs. And having nitric oxide in your lungs increases oxygen uh, uptake by ten to twenty percent. Oh wow! So, so if you breathe through your mouth, you can breathe a little bit more faster, more shallow, and you start to hyperventilate. Your carbon dioxide goes down. You get more anxious and tired. So that's why these deep breathing techniques through the nose are very valuable. And it's interesting in um, like in ancient Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, yeah. mm -hmm. they always talk about uh, patients being more anxious who breathe through their mouth versus yeah. yoga breathing kind of has mm -hmm. that kind of calming effect and works more on that, that parasympathetic chain. So um, it's cool to kind of get that scientific backing behind that. Exactly. Yeah. And this and the, in Ayurvedic medicine, it was well known thousands of years ago. Um, but now we're just kind of realizing that there's a scientific basis behind it. So uh, amazing. Well, um, all amazing points. I actually, I learned a lot from just from just talking to you and um, great stuff. And so um, I, I want everyone to kind of uh, to kind of uh, follow you on your uh, your podcast, which we talked about. Um, and we're going to put that up as well as your website, which is doctor uh, spelled out as Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R Stephen Park dot com. And then you've written a book um, on this on Amazon, which is Sleep Interrupted. So um, awesome stuff. Uh, I'm going to keep listening to your podcast because uh, uh, when it comes to sleep, oh, my God, you know so much more about that and uh, so many things just about improving our lifestyle in so many other ways. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. It was a pleasure.